All right, welcome to the Question Coincidence channel and the launch of our all new series beginning with episode one, The Joseph Conspiracy with Trey Smith and myself, Michael Hughes. So did Noah, Abraham and Isaac really exist? And did any of the stories about them actually happen? And are any of those people part of our actual history? Now we know that this is a crazy controversial subject, especially in certain countries. So we wanted to do this right. So join us as we travel all across Egypt, across the Sinai, even deep into the Red Sea. And you decide if these amazing people and their adventures actually happened, or all the filming and documenting we've done in Egypt is really just coincidence. So stay tuned. There's a cool surprise near the end and also a preview to our next upcoming episode, episode two. And if you like what you see, send a link to your friends and tell other people about this series. And if you want to support us, you can go to questioncoincidence.com and buy all sorts of cool stuff. Not only a DVD of this episode, but also a coin. Now behind me is the Red Sea. You know, we can't even count the number of references there are to three historical men, three real people that really lived, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. In fact, there are millions of people, even today, that say that they are descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. Now, Jacob had 12 sons, and one of those sons, his name is Joseph. Think about this. If Joseph never existed, then Moses never existed, there was never a Passover, and there was never an exodus. Is that right? That's why where we stand is where the staging area was, where the waters would actually fall. That's where we, that's where we are right now. It's all a story. It's all coincidence. Any evidence that points to the real life Joseph is just coincidence, that's what we're taught. If these groups, governments, and even their museums around the world are telling you and your children that Joseph never existed and that any evidence referring to Joseph is merely coincidence, then I say let's question coincidence. Over the last 20 years, I've had the great opportunity to film some pretty exciting discoveries all over the world. Now these discoveries, we've had the pleasure of documenting in real time as they happen. I'm an inventor and I wanted to set up a new type of assistance, a way to help a discoverer while they're in the midst of digging for, let's say an artifact, a sunken ship, even a lost city. Well, if they find it, we're there as their witness. Now, our assistance is free, and the only downside is, if they fail, we witness that too. This time, I'll be in Egypt with Trey Smith to document his search to discover the lost history of the Exodus. And while I'm there, I'll also focus on finding and filming the hidden historical evidence of Joseph. All right, this is what it looks like flying to, uh, so you get out of Munich. Hey, what's your name, man? Uh, I'm Trey, man. This is the plane. So with uh, Shingu, China, right? China? Uh, yes. The plane to Shingu. So, uh, oh yeah, man. Well, it's good. We're on our way. Yeah. One more leg after this, and we're there. Yes. Well. Yeah. We're, yeah. So we just Cairo, and then from Cairo to Luxor. Cairo to Luxor, and yeah. You've been flying. Where did you start at this morning? We were in where? Yeah, I was in Knoxville, Tennessee. Knoxville, yeah, so Tennessee. From Pigeon Forge, Knoxville. Pigeon Forge, Knoxville. Knoxville Colorado. And came to Denver. I picked you up this morning. Yeah. Then uh, our planes, were, our flights were canceled. Yeah. So yeah. then you negotiated. And a I negotiated ticket. a deal for a uh, plane, uh, plane to here. Oh, by the way, the seats have got this. Uh, I don't know. It's a symbol of Ra on there. It's Egypt Air. Yeah, actually, and, uh, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. 
and then from here you you get on another plane to uh, to Luxor, which I just booked in the lobby out there because because it yeah. just made more sense. Than well, and it, well, and I we don't know if there's any rental cars there, but there was a lady that was saying there's the roads that are going to take you to Luxor. Uh, I'll do it. So, so from Luxor, using taxis, horses, camels, and even hot air balloons, we're going to search out every historical site we can as we gradually work our way through Egypt's vast desert, even across the Sinai to the Red Sea. Then we'll head west back towards our base in Cairo. So I've seen this all in pictures when I was, uh, when I was growing up. This is the Nile River down here we're crossing over. And um, I used to, um, when, I was, when I was younger, I would buy Egypt books and never really believed that I would so we're we're here we're in egypt and i never really thought that i would be standing out here but this is in day one so we're on the bridge that crosses from one side of the nile over here to the other side of the nile and we're going over here so it's on this side where the the, the entire all of the kings of egypt so ramses and all of these guys they're they're in the uh, uh uh, they're buried in the Valley of the Kings. And I remember seeing all of these shots and photos that you're looking at out here when I would grow up. Is that for a week? Yes. I, I never thought I would see these things in real life. This is, this is amazing that we're actually here in Egypt, isn't it? This is yeah. incredible. Yeah, this will be some great shots. This would be a good time to take note of some of the things that we learned while we were traveling throughout Egypt especially if you have no plans to utilize any of the state-sanctioned tourist services. We've been driving in the desert for about two hours. And, uh, That's I've since been Kenna. Yeah. Uh, I've, been, I've been asleep in the car. And uh, here are our drivers. Well, we're definitely in the desert right now. Once we, uh, Ken, what's it called? Ken, the city we left? Kenna. Kenna. Once we left Kenna, everything was green and lush, a lot of farmland, all that, little towns, little villages sprinkled everywhere, and then, as soon as you get out of Kenna, desert, nothing. This is where they grow sand. That's the big crop here. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. If you want to visit any of the lesser known historical sites that are not available on any of the state licensed tours. Where are we right now? Is this Russia? <laughs> Put aside any real or apparent danger you might be exposed to. Not only are the conditions of the roads, traffic, stores, restaurants, and available accommodations pretty unsettling for most people. Remember, this is not the Egypt that most people see from fancy hotels or tour buses. So, you might be in for a bit of a culture shock. Alright, I would say there's, there's at least a noticeable difference between this room and accommodations that we just had. And uh, it's, it's a little, a little sparse, but... You um, have a balcony. We've got a balcony, that's pretty awesome. And uh, of course the bathroom accommodations, pretty incredible. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm to be a little careful with this door. You can't quite get it open for the bed. But, um, but isn't that amazing? Hey, let me go out in the patio. I wanna see, see what the view is. Yeah. Okay, here's our balcony view. It's pretty sharp, take a look. We'll, uh, we'll probably see this a little bit more in the morning. In the interest of safety, at some checkpoints we were detained a number of hours until an armed escort had arrived to support us through specific parts of the desert. Sometimes, additional officers were put inside the vehicle with us.
Okay, good morning everybody. Packing up, going to the next site. This, uh, this is the town we were in. Pretty amazing. Yeah, pretty amazing. Uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, we're, uh, went away to the Tele Lamana, Lamana site. And we slept here, and I'm not sure what the name of this town is. But we're in the middle of the desert. This is a town that they say is bigger than Luxor. It's it's a real deal here. It's a real, real Egyptian life. This palace, when it was here in its day, look at these pillars, they almost look like, uh, they almost look like cranes of corn, sort of. But this palace that you're looking at behind me, this was one of the largest, might have been the largest, probably what many speculate it was, the largest palace in all of Egypt. All that's here today is just the rubble of its remains. But this king, Akhenaten, he brought, he moved the capital of the country out into the middle of the desert a long ways from Abydos and Thebes and Memphis or lower Egypt or upper Egypt I'm sorry and also a long ways from the capital in lower Egypt which is at the top where the Nile is up at the top it's kind of in the middle of the two and it's in the middle of the desert two pillars two pillars Akhenaten, his name was changed from, normally it was the man's name and the God's name. So, Atum, uh, Aten means one God, one God. His name before that was Amen. That's an original, that's a traditional Egyptian God. Amen, like you would have an Amen Ra. So he actually changed his name to mean one God and he went throughout the country and began tearing down all of the old gods of Egypt. And this here where we stand, this was his palace. The grandest palace in all of Egypt at one time stood right here. All right, so Trey, this is the first king or the first pharaoh that had claimed that there's only one god, right? Yeah. Only one god. All the other ones are essentially fake. So we changed everybody to say, no more 10 gods, and now there's just one, right? Yeah. Okay, so how did everybody react to that, this new king, his idea? Well, he was, he was killed by his, uh, uh, pr probably by the priests of Egypt from uh, Upper and Lower Egypt, because, uh, or, you know, they, because the, the Pharaoh system, the Egyptian system, lived off those gods, you know, they, uh, 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 you have priests and the government of the country if it says the gods aren't valuable anymore they're going to be upset about that because all those temples are about those gods so they so um, you know they had him killed and they returned the, the gods back and that's, that's what uh, that's what most people are going to believe 
and uh, and Tut died right when he came back. Tut was the son. He returned the uh, country to the gods, and but he was just a kid, so he didn't. I mean, he's got other people guiding him. Uh, so like uh, his father and his visor, I. And um, so there's a lot of people that believe that uh, that I had him killed, the visor for both him and his father. And it might have been the head military leader that actually did it, Ramses the first, because you, you start in a new dynasty there. I think with Ramses the first, Seti the second, and then and then the the big one, Ramses the, the second, is the next king. But you start, but you end the 18th dynasty right there. Uh, with Tide, and you start in with the new dynasty, the 19th. This is King Akhenaten right here. This is the king that ruled in Amarna and changed the entire religion. He started tearing down all of the old gods to just one god named Aten. That's the symbol of Aten right there. That's not the sun god because Egypt already had a sun god, Ra. You see the lines coming down from Aten, which is the god of the day. The god of the end of the day is who that is. And you see the lines coming down. Now I want you to notice that by Nefertiti's nose, he's got the symbol of the arm. That means eternal life. The line that comes down by Akhenaten's nose is the arm. That means eternal life. But the lines are coming down everywhere on all of the people of Egypt. There was something wrong with all of the old gods of Egypt. That's why this king, even the artwork is friendlier. The wife is friendlier looking. His wife's name is beautiful. This is why Ramses II wanted to sort of trump, if you will, Akhenaten because there was something special about this king and the changing it to one god the Hebrews had left. He was copying Hebrew practices. After visiting the remains of Akhenaten's palace in Amarna and knowing that once Akhenaten is dead, his top visor, I, would immediately become the standing pharaoh of Egypt, at least until Akhenaten's son Tutankhamun later known as King Tut, was old enough to rule. We wanted to film the inside of not only Akhenaten's tomb, but also his visor, I. Keep in mind, film and sound equipment are strictly forbidden within any of these rarely seen ancient sites. So we met with some men and made an arrangement. They would unlock the tombs of both kings and allow us to film inside. But in the interest of safety, they would use their own warm and fuzzy guides to take us there. visor of Akhenaten and the famous King Tut is also speculated to have been the one to have killed King Tut. So we're looking at an actual sarcophagus. This is his his tomb, King King I. And this is his sarcophagus right here that we're looking at. Right now we're in a tomb that's not usually, in fact, it's restricted to be photographed or even filmed. For the first time in history, we're going to film this room and this tomb in 360 degrees, 5K resolution, never before done. And after that, we'll also unlock the gates and take our cameras into what Egyptians and the world's museums now call the tomb of the heretic king, Akhenaten. So why do today's so-called educators put so much effort into trying to erase the history of this king? Because he was not only the next pharaoh immediately after the exodus of the Bible, but he was also the first king of Egypt to proclaim that there is surely only one true and powerful God in all the world, the God of the Hebrews, the sons of Jacob. This is this is the symbol for autumn right here. This, so I'm actually touching it. One of the symbols for autumn, the one going. 
the one dollar idea. idea. And um, this would have been the court, this would have been the image of the king right here. And the rays of the uh, sun, this is uh, a god that was in the day. And it was coming down, all the rays. And you would have onks that would hit him. Onk means eternal life. And um, here's one of the symbols. Right there, in his walls. Deep in his tomb, underneath the ground. Yeah, I want you to take a look at this room. It's pretty small. Would you say about 12 by 12 yeah, in dimension? Yeah. Coming through. So beautiful, guys. Amazing. Wow. Oh, wow. What is this? Oh, those are boxes. <laughs> Just boxes. Okay. And it goes down a little deeper. Wow. Going in. Wow, look at this. is the tomb and the rooms of the Pharaoh Akhenaten that you're walking through. The Pharaoh, they changed everything. This is the room where the sarcophagus was. And you're underneath the ground. You're about a hundred and, well, you're about uh, uh, 200 kilometers out of uh, Luxor. And uh, you're underneath the ground in the tomb of Akhenaten. Right now, that's what this is. This is what that looked like. What that looked like this was the Pharaoh that changed everything. Are there any more depictions on any walls? That was it. No more depictions no. on any walls. Okay. All right, man. I think we're we're done. That was probably a symbol of Aten right there. Who knows? Excellent, guys. That's it. That's beautiful. The Pharaoh Akhenaten. Hey, Akhenaton. Akhenaton, yes. okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. This is a beautiful, this is the, what that looks like. We're walking from uh, darkness underground into the light up here. So, I'm coming, coming out of the tomb. You're coming from darkness to light. In the tomb of Akhenaton. This would be a good time for me to point out a few things. I'm not an archaeologist, and I'm not educated in any of the Egyptian historical narrative. I'm just an inventor, and most of my products since the 1980s have been things for cars and trucks. In fact, my most recent invention that just came out this last December was an accident. I mean, <laughs> it's in seven countries now, but I was actually looking for something completely different. A food that would use, well, food from trees, tree bark. Did you know that tree bark can actually be used as food and not only just a food, but a food that can help increase or even restore great blood circulation or even communication between your mind and your body. It's a great food. And in fact, it's a food that's been known for a long time that we just have forgotten about. So using this tree bark, I was getting great results with women that had MS. In fact, there was one woman in particular who not only was able to get rid of all of her pain meds, but also was able to stop having to walk with a cane. The surprise came when men started taking it and not only did they have great blood flow, but everything started working. Everything. So the obvious thing to do was to go ahead and sell a version of that for men and I called it Rocket Man, as in GetRocketMan.com. So what does Rocket Man have to do with Egyptian history? Nothing. I'm just an inventor. That's my point. I don't have any education specifically about Egyptian history at all, but I want to learn what it is, and I want to learn especially what's not talked about in schools or colleges. I believe if you were an inventor and you had success on some of your products, you would probably do the same thing. You'd want to do something that you believed was important. And for me, I want to learn more about our history, the real history. Yeah, let's do that.
Let's bring everything into the light. You know, for too long, we've all been entombed in the dark, just like Akhenaten. Here's a news flash. Did you know Akhenaten? He not only believed in one true God, but he regarded his wife as an equal to him in marriage. He's the first pharaoh that ever did that. In fact, he's the only pharaoh that ever did that. Her name was Nefertiti. An amazing woman and what she accomplished in her life as well, even after he was killed. And remember, her son, their son, is Tutankhamun, who we know as King Tut. In fact, he built in stone as a testimony to his belief in one God. In fact, he named the city that he created where he put his palace, Armana, and that means the horizon of one God that saves us all. Did you also know that many years before Akhenaten, even up to the third dynasty, that all the pharaohs in history up to that point, even the third dynasty, lived in mud houses? They were all relatively poor, actually. Until that third dynasty, there's this guy named King Zosier. He became so wealthy that his wealth kicked off all the dynasties that followed him. Now, what happened that made him so wealthy? Did you ever think of that? He was so wealthy, in fact, that he built what today still stands as the oldest temple and pyramid complex in all the world. Now, a guy that grew up in mud houses, what motivated him to suddenly build everything in stone? Did you know that before King Zosier, no one in Egypt have ever, ever built a column or a cornerstone or built anything of stone? Didn't know how to do it. <laughs> Did King Zosia just suddenly wake up and said, I'm going to build a pyramid. So what if there's a connection between the artifacts found in King Zosia's complex and pyramid that links that temple pyramid and structure to Akhenaten's palace in Amarna? Well, there is. And it's found in the two remaining artifacts of all the palace, two lone columns. So let's go to King Zosier's complex in Saqqara and listen to what the state, the Egyptian state, teaches that King Zosier was motivated by to build such a complex. Again, that complex is the largest and oldest temple and pyramid complex in all of Egypt and all the world. Okay, here, come on. This is the entrance. This is the entrance. We put it to close it all around the pyramid, all the way around the pyramid. It used to be very high. Up. Okay, so this went in. This used to be the entrance for, for, for the king. But this the is the entrance, the only one way in. Only one way in, and, and one that's, way out. that's uh, Joser's castle. Those are, those, are, those are pyramid, and you have the engineer, he, make the, he designed to make the, the, the entrance in and out. In and out, it was not fall down. And, and the engineer is Imhotep. Uh, Imhotep. Am I saying that right? Imhotep. Imhotep. <laughs> it's not no, you have to say No, 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 say, okay. Imhotep. Imhotep. Yes. All right, so Imhotep designed all this. He designed to make in and out the first one. Nobody know how to build this, but he at least he done it in and out because the out square, square when he's coming, if he's straight, he come and fall down. That's why he hold too much in and out. Ah, okay. So that's the main entrance. And then that's the castle he built the for, King for King Dozier, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. How do you say Dozier? Zozer. Oh, Zozer. King Zozer. King Zozer. Zozer, yeah. All right. And this was all behind that yeah. fence. So that wall right there continued all the way around down to the temple and the pyramid like all a big way. rectangle yes i turned them yeah it's amazing isn't it yeah 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 and here we are and right behind us used to be 
behind the, is the Nile. The Nile. Yeah. And then in the middle of the Nile was the, 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 uh, the, Bala, the Memphis, the city. The city of Memphis. If it is the city in, in the world, it used to be in Memphis. You have to be in the mountain. Yeah, the mountain that is green, no building, no anything, because it's not allowed to build anything there. It's green, empty. Okay. But the building is different village. But the empty, green, is the Memphis there. Okay. Because it's not allowed to build any house or anything near to Memphis. Ah, okay. It's not allowed. It's, like it's incredible. You can build a house with a villa here. Yeah, and that's the first pyramid the in all of Egypt. In all the world. Built by the first hand man, Imhotep, Imhotep to Imhotep. the king, who Imhotep. actually spoke to God. Yeah, he spoke to God. Yeah. And he told the king what God told. Right? And he told him, I want to build my first pyramid. No king built it like mine. He built it with six steps, one by one, smaller, 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 till he got the six. Ah. No one built like this. No one built it like no. that. No. The other 92 after the king's house, he built the same shape. Same ah. shape. All right, so this is the facility of Dozier, right? Zosa. Okay, so that is Dozier's pyramid. Statue, yes. Right? And then Imhotep built this whole thing. All the all complex. The yes. whole complex he yes. designed. Yeah. First guy to the king. For the, for the engineer. In the world. And he spoke to God yes. on behalf of, 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 of God, of God of and he God spoke of, to Dozier, king. Yes, of God of Ra. Yes. Wow. So he's like the top guy. Like top guy. Yeah. And he built those pits. No, he built these bits, and then you have another injury for King Wanis. Well, that's later, though. Zosar belonged to the King Zosar. Okay, and um, and that in the center right there is the King Dozier, the statue of the King Zosar. Okay, and of course that's Dozier's the step pyramid. And is that the oldest one in Egypt? The, the oldest one. The oldest one. This is the first, this first the oldest yes. one. Yes. Yes. Wow. And then um, and then he built the school at Hepset for celebrate when he became a king. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing here, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And that facility right behind this is the, you. The, this is the, the entrance to the, to the open court. Okay, so that's the, 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 the one entrance to the open court. Was 40 columns. And with 40 columns, 20 in each side. 20 in each side with the rooms, many different rooms for the statue of the family of Okay, Old the little Earth. niches were for yes, statues. for the statue. Okay, and then, um, and then the pits, all the big. All the how big. many? There were nine pits? Nine. And they were just used for sacrifice. For sacrifice, right? yeah. And, and you see the one in deep shaft for the kidney and liver. Deep shaft, the first one. Near the okay, right. so it's it's a deep shaft because it's for the kidney and liver. Yeah, to be king of Upper Egypt and the body inside pyramid for Low Egypt. Okay, and that's why those pits are like yes, that. Yes, yes. And there's nine of them. Yeah. And there's and there's tunnels connecting the pits, right? It's connected to bits. Okay. So so if somebody came here, they would go to that facility there. They enter and only for king and the family. And for the, the king engineer. family, and they'd go <coughs> through the main hall. And the engineer go in. Uh, 20 columns on each side? Yeah, 40, 20 on each side. Okay. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> and they look like palm trees, right? Yeah. Okay. This is like a palace in pharaonic time. And it's, it's like a palace. It's amazing. Yes. And of course, the Nile River was just really yeah, right over there. Oh, true. right over here? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. then on the other side, or in the middle of that Nile was Memphis. The Memphis, the capital. Yeah. Okay. And then on the other side is where they the, quarried the other, stone. The other desert is called Mokatnam, when he got the stone to build the pyramid from there. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And then this <coughs> is different places where they do prayers. And when he prayed, yes. So you walk up here and pray to Yeah, he prayed to the sun. To the God, pray of the sun, the God of the sun. And there's his statue in the center. Yes. And uh, Imhotep, pretty important guy. He's in the world, yeah. He's the, like, he's the something. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's God, second God. And he's the first to do arches. He's also the first to design pyramids, he right? He designed the one with the steps. And he's the first to design <coughs> buildings with stone? With the stone, limestone. With limestone. Yeah. And again, the <coughs> first to do arches. The arch, yes. The and he's a priest the king. He's priest the king. <laughs> and he spoke to God. He spoke to God. And yes. so God would talk to him. And help him. And then he would tell what he would tell the king what to say what God said. Yes, you're right. Pretty important guy. Yeah. He had a walkie-talkie. The token with the God. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. After meeting with this guide, a great guy by the way, we had the opportunity to meet with a number of other people throughout Egypt, including people down at the Cairo Museum, and ask them about Imhotep and King Zosier. So the Cairo Egyptian scholars, even those at the Cairo Museum, all agree that there was this guy that appeared essentially from nowhere and quickly took control of all of Egypt through the authority of King Zosier. So they admit there's a man who came from another land who came in peace and was made the high priest of the king and that he was acting under the authority of God. That's what they admit. So this man, Imhotep, they also admit 
brought the pharaohs out of the mud homes and palaces and taught them the engineering fundamentals of constructing amazing stone structures that would last throughout the reigns of all the pharaohs of Egypt to follow. And this structure, his first structure and pyramid complex, remains even to this day. But that's not all. They also claim he was the first physician in all of Egypt and even all the world. And not only all the pharaohs that would live long after his death, but even the Egyptian people continued to revere and bring offerings to his grave for over a thousand years after his death. Now for 3,000 years he was also worshipped in Greece and Rome. When the Greeks conquered Egypt, they were amazed at his accomplishments and adopted his methodologies in their medicine and continued to build temples to him. Even Hippocrates himself, founder of the Hippocratic Oath in which all physicians today swear by, did not regard himself as the father of medicine, but instead he gave that credit to Imhotep. So it's pretty clear that Imhotep has made some of the biggest marks in not just Egyptian history, but also Greek and Roman history. Imhotep's a pretty famous guy, but we still don't know enough about King Zosia to learn how he made all his wealth so we could fund big projects like this and hundreds more that would follow. Okay, here's another important fact that we needed to know. That facility that was designed by the world famous Imhotep was designed for a specific purpose. And King Zosia was already on his way to becoming the wealthiest man in the history of Egypt before he died. So what we really need to learn is what was Zosia's complex originally designed to do and how did that contribute to the wealth of the kingdom? I got a pretty good idea that if we look closer at those pits, we'll get a good clue. this side of me as I look this way. Okay, we're back here at Saqqara and um, this is the, uh, well, this is a facility in Saqqara. If you look over here, you've got uh, the uh, pyramid, the step pyramid of Dozer, right? Zozer. 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 Step pyramid of Zozer. This is the entrance, the entrance to the facility to the, here. The open court, yeah. What's that? The entrance to the open court. Okay, the entrance to the open court. This is our guide and uh, what's your name? Abbas. Abetz? Abes. 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 Very, very smart. Been doing this for a long time. If you look around, um, just an amazing sight around this whole facility. Great historical significance of this. Now, as I'm told, just beyond that wall over there is uh, was the Nile. And right in the middle of the Nile was uh, Memphis, right? Memphis. And on the other side of Memphis, on the other side of the Nile, was the place that they quarried the stone. This is incredible here, isn't it? Okay, so just to, just to be sure, I was filming the very front of that building right over there, right? And it's only one entrance, right? And yes, one entrance. One entrance. And when you went through that entrance, you go through all those columns. Go to 40 columns. 40 columns. And 20 in each side. Oh, 20 in each side. And each column, you look like palm trees. Palm trees. They do. Okay, palm trees. All right. And then you get into the big courtyard. And now, is that open courtyard completely enclosed? Closed. Yeah. yeah, and there's only one way in. One way in. There's only one way out? One way in, one way, in, one way out for the king. Ah, the king. okay. Is there a second way out that no. way? It's the other side for another king when he's... Oh, okay. So there's two entrances. One here. And the other one back for the king. And the other one, the back side. The one in the road you saw. Yeah, yeah. The back. Okay, so if if we came to visit Imhotep, we would go through this main yes. door here. Yeah. We'd be in the courtyard with all the pits. Yeah. And then when we wanted to leave, we'd go out that door. Yeah. No, same way. Or we'd come out the front. Same way. Okay. Are those little, you know the columns? There's little booths. Rooms. The little, Rooms. little. Rooms. Yeah, what are those? This is for used to be half a statue. A statue for the Oh, you think all those are just for statues? For the statue and most of it is going now. Yeah, yeah. Old. It's very pretty. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Okay. Excellent. Okay, this is one of the huge pits. 
one of several huge pits at this facility that um, Emotep had designed and built. Pretty fascinating. Now, we used to raise cattle, that's how I was raised, and um, when we would store grain, we would store them in open pit silos. So the first thing I think of when I see this is, of course, storage of grain. Pretty deep, in fact, really deep. And um, you might see those holes, those rolls of holes going all the way down. You know, as different levels of uh, grain or materials is stored, that's a pretty good way to, to set a different deck or level as um, the level of the grain or whatever you're storing is stored here. But again, that's a guess of mine. I'm not sure what the, uh, uh, what the um, local state or the guides are told to say what this is, but um, that's what it looks like to me, only because of, well, my background. So how many pits are there like this? No, a lot. There's a lot of them, like 12 or something? Like maybe nine. Oh, about nine of them. So the official, so the official um, reason for this, these pits are, they were for sacrifice? Sacrifice is there, yeah. That's what it's for? Yeah, it's I see, I see. All right, so these pits are mainly just for sacrifice. Only for sacrifice and for the king. Just for sacrifice, sacrifice. for the king. For the king. This is okay. shaft for, what are okay. these pits for? Okay, this is shaft, the king is the engineer and what that. Still, you want to control Egypt. You want to control Upper Egypt and Low Egypt. Okay, but what did what were these pits this used the entrance, for? The entrance to uh -huh. the shop. What was the pits used for? They used them for the kidney and liver. For the kidney. Okay, stop right there. Is this guy cereal? Are we to believe that these giant pits that were carved deep into the bedrock, their only purpose was to sacrifice a kidney or liver for the king? <laughs> so why would he need a giant pit to sacrifice a kidney? And even more, why would he need nine pits? So what, maybe Monday and Tuesdays he'd do kidney and livers at these pits, and maybe elbows and ankles on Thursdays and Fridays, is that the deal? Kind of a variety show? See, what the public isn't told is there's more than just nine pits. There's more pits that were constructed that were later covered up by the pyramid that was built later after King Zosier died. The pits are organized in groups that are interconnected with an elaborate angled tunnel system underground. And none of them have any hieroglyphic carvings, pictures, or paintings on the inside that would indicate they were originally designed to be used for any religious purpose whatsoever. But what has been found throughout all these pits is the remains of grain. And accordingly, it's pretty simple to find carvings and artifacts that show that these pits were originally designed as huge grain silos for enormous amounts of food. So think about this, what would King Zosier need with such an enormous food storage facility? In 1890, Charles Wilbur discovered on the island of Sahal, at the first cataract in the Nile, a large boulder, like an ancient billboard, which includes a story of Imhotep dating about a thousand years after Imhotep's death. Now, if you think of the Nile as a superhighway for the king in ancient times, it's clear that this written notice was intended for the then current king to read as their boat passed by. The billboard goes on to say that the pharaoh of a great many years earlier was distressed about a dream regarding a famine, and he enlisted the help of Imhotep, who could speak to God. Under Himhotep's direction, the pharaoh stored an enormous amount of grain in preparation of an upcoming seven-year famine. And selling the grain during the famine, the pharaoh became incredibly wealthy. Now, whilst that pharaoh began acquiring vast amounts of land, King Zosier, he promised he would set aside specific lands for the priests. So this billboard, which looks like it was written by disgruntled Egyptian priests, was intended to remind their current pharaoh that the same land should remain in their possession as promised by Pharaoh Zosier over a thousand years earlier. Now there's another inscription just like it on the island of Philae, only this one has the priests of Isis stating that Zosier made the same gift to their god for about the same reason, because of the famine. Remember, most of the sites that you go to in Egypt, especially the museums and the actual sites that have guards, they don't allow you to film there. So if you do make an arrangement to pay them to film, make sure you have, like we did, some extra cameras that might be floating around that they don't notice. Hey, how are you? Hello. How are you? I'm pretty good. Ticket? Yeah, you want to see a ticket? Ticket. It goes into my iPhone. 
You want a seat? Yes. How are you? A journalist? Uh, journalist now. Ahmed. Video and Mr. Bass interview. This problem, big problem here. Oh, can I cut across there? Yeah. Okay. The faster? Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, everybody move, leave, and then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's better for you and me. I think you got so. jealous. I took you. So, why would you have some extra cameras? Well, because you paid them to allow you to film. And if you start asking things they don't like, they might take your cameras, but not the ones they don't see. You see, the guides, they don't like to give up some of this information. You got to kind of coax it or pull it out of them. 20 columns on each side? Yeah, 40, 20 on each side. Okay. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> and they look like palm trees, right? Yeah. Okay. The point is, I want the actual Egyptians and their guides and their museums to tell us what they teach everybody is history. I want them to say what it is, and then I'll ask pointed questions and see how they react. So let's take a look so far of what we've learned from the actual Egyptians themselves, their own museums, their own sites, their own archaeology, and their own state-sanctioned guides. Okay, the Egyptian museums and the state-sanctioned guides all admit these things. Now bear with me, this list is a little long, so I'm going to read my notes. Number one. The pharaohs Zosier and Imhotep were real people. They really existed. Number two, before Imhotep, all the pharaohs before him lived in mud houses. Number three, Imhotep, a real man from another land, not an Egyptian, arrived on the scene and attained the reins and control of Egypt under the authority of the king Zosier. Very important, number four, this amazing man, Imhotep, is actually the original designer and architect of all the stone homes, monuments, palaces, temples, and even the pyramids that still remain today. Number five, unlike all the pharaohs of Egypt, Imhotep and his amazing accomplishments have been honored by the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans for over 3,000 years. Six, Imhotep is recorded as the first physician in all of history and he spoke to God. And what's also really surprising is the Egyptian narrative also admits that Imhotep, after he spoke with God, would tell King Zosier what to do and King Zosier would do it. And number seven, I like this the best. The Pharaoh, King Zosier, was distressed by a dream of an upcoming famine and Imhotep, after hearing his dream and speaking with God, Imhotep designed and built the first stone complex and pyramid facility in the world. Okay, here's a quick question. Why would the museums and governments of the world try to erase the history of Imhotep? Is it because he just hasn't accomplished anything in his life? Is it because, you know, saving millions of people from a famine is just too devastating of a story to tell everybody? I don't get it. Is it just too damaging to the official Egyptian narrative if people learn that the Egyptians were not in fact the original designers of their own famous palaces and pyramids? Or is there a much deeper reason? What if the real reason why the history of Imhotep is being erased from all the textbooks is because if we all learn more about Imhotep and what he did, we'd realize there's a huge parallel between Imhotep and somebody that's mentioned several times throughout the Bible. What if Imhotep is actually Joseph, one of the sons of Jacob of the Bible? See, in Genesis chapter 40, Joseph, we are told, was able to interpret dreams, hear from God, and speak to the Pharaoh regarding an upcoming seven-year famine. Did you know the word Pharaoh is actually a Hebrew word? It's not Egyptian? And did you ever take a look at what Imhotep means in English? In fact, the name Imhotep in English means the voice of I am. Coincidence, right? Next time on Question Coincidence, The Joseph Conspiracy, Part 2.
join us while we search for answers as hidden clues in Zosier's complex, built by Joseph, cry out to be revealed. incredible connection between a commitment of the God of Joseph and the horrible murder of Pharaoh Akhenaten and his son, known as King Tut. Mm -hmm.